<laughs> 19 years old. Does it look the same? I have oh. shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, that uh, clearly was the moment at which, you know, you began to make your impact uh, barely out of your teens or still, it, still in your teens. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, if you could talk about, you know, we see now when we see uh, uh, young actresses or actors, uh, performers, musicians make their impact that young, often, uh, you know, it's just a kind of tabloid story, a tale of, um, you know, terrible problems uh, that people struggle with that kind of glare that comes uh, with success at such a young age. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about its impact on you at the time and uh, you know, how you felt about it and how you dealt with it. Um, at the time, and I was just out of high school, I moved to Cambridge and fell in love with folk music for real, spent all my time playing it. I never planned a future. See, my idea of the future was the following Wednesday. <laughs> and I just started to sing early with a ukulele. And I sang, I realized, a lot for myself as I was a lonely kid. We moved too often, and too often I couldn't keep friends. So I kept my ukulele uh, close to my chest and then graduated to a guitar when I was 15. And I was not considered shy, but there's something in me that was shy. Um, but I began playing, people began listening. Um, I guess I, since I wasn't planning on a career, I wasn't really planning on anything, when it started to happen, uh, I accepted it, you know, that I was a singer, and um, I was very, very staunch about that I was well known. The other stars, people were stars and they were famous, but I was just well known. <laughs> I, 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 I think the responsibility of um, more than that was probably frightening, although I didn't experience it that way. Um, in high school, I hadn't really had a very good image of myself. And so when he kind of traded it in for the Virgin Mary with those Bible shoes on, it was fair enough for me, you know. I would take that one over, you know, skinny Mexican, which really was a problem for me, <laughs> cleaning up, yeah. So, in the, you know, just the things that happened next were that I chose um, Vanguard Record Company over Columbia, and Columbia was bigger and uh, more gold records and so on. I think that frightened me as well. So I just wanted to sign with this classical music um, company, and I did. I guess I kept myself safe, you know, by by going that route. And I'm glad that I did. I mean, I'm really glad that I whatever kept me going in that direction did. Well, it was interesting too because I mean, at a time certainly, uh, I mean, it was a rare thing for anyone coming out of the folk world uh, to achieve the level of prominence that you did. And it was particularly rare for a woman. I mean, you really broke down a lot of barriers in that regard. And I wonder how conscious you were about that, you know, how much you know, that meant to you at the time. I wasn't conscious of it at all. In fact, it didn't phase me to sing a song that was supposed to be sung by a man or a song that was supposed to be sung by a woman it, to me. I just did it, and I realized later on that some people had a concern about that, but I never shared that concern, so I just sang these beautiful songs, um, image-wise. Yeah. Talk about what attracted you to uh, you know, the folk songs that you sang so powerfully. What was it about them that, that uh, drew you to them? I didn't know it at the time, again, but um, I think I chose long, sad ballads in which somebody had to die or it didn't qualify my <laughs> repertoire. <laughs> and I know now that I was speaking to whatever that sadness was within myself, and that's why I think they comforted me. Um, it's, what's interesting is that people wanted to hear them. I mean, people who otherwise didn't think of themselves as sad were attracted to those songs. Um, that's how it kind of began. And uh, you know, during that period, uh, you know, in the early 60s, you know, there was, uh, you know, a, a relationship between a lot of the social movements of the time, you know, the, uh, you know, what was kind of 
often referred to as the kind of ban the bomb or anti-nuclear yeah. movement, uh, certainly the civil rights movement. And pretty early on, you know, that became uh, a, a way, I think, for you to use your fame uh, that came to you so early. Uh, I wonder if you could tell a little bit about, uh, you know, how that happened, because it, you know, it's, it's certainly not something that was uh, necessarily typical. Um, I think it goes back to my family being Quaker. My mother and father became Quaker when I was about eight. And most of you know, but the main thing being a Quaker is that you put human life before a nation state, always, which means you don't kill. You, may, you have the right to die for something, but not to kill for something. So I heard that very early on in my life. Um, uh, when I was 10 years old, I lived in Baghdad for almost a year. Very bizarre. My father was building a physics lab for the University of Baghdad. He was with UNESCO. UNESCO, as he said, um, it's almost as good as real coffee. <laughs> 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 but that's how much people knew about it. Um, but while I was there, my mother gave me a copy of Anne Frank's diary. And that lodged itself somewhere in my heart and soul, identified with her so strongly. So I guess, you know, in that context of, of what I heard daily, the arguments about what would you do if somebody were trying to nail your grandmother, and nobody ever being able to answer, that, answer it sufficiently for the person who's asking it, because they're making it more hypothetical than it is. Um, but I, I grew up, and I wondered myself, what you do when somebody's attacking your grandmother. I never heard an answer to it, but it certainly made me ponder um, year after year. And I, I guess when I was 14 or 15, it was before I was even well known. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or even famous for that matter. Yeah. Even famous, that's right. Um, I went with my father and mother, um, probably sisters, to, um, it was anti-bomb shelter was, the, was that, first March, I think, and my father had water balloons dropped on his head, so I began to get the general idea what those um, gatherings would be like. I was comfortable there. I didn't get water balloon landing on my head, but, but it felt right to do that. And I guess it just, you know, with the, well, I guess it's worth mentioning that when I was 16, I heard Martin Luther King speak, and he was probably about 29. And um, I'd heard about him, and I'd heard a little bit about what he was doing, but to see him speaking about what was actually happening <laughs> in Alabama. Yeah, something else I get going on this. Well, I wonder, uh, you know, one of the things of, uh, from that period is how many great songwriters there were to addressing some of these issues, you know, uh, at a point at which it seemed like you wanted to bring together the kinds of things that you were singing about and the kinds of activism that you were engaging in. You know, suddenly there was Bob Dylan, there were you know, a number of other songwriters who were you know, doing uh, work that specifically addressed those issues. I wonder you know, if you could talk about uh, you know, that moment in time and that discovery of these, these great writers. Well, the great writers came when I was well into making albums. They were not political albums. I think the first political song that went on an album was very early on. That was God on My Side. And I remember that Vanguard conveniently forgot about it and put something else on the record, I guess hoping I wouldn't notice. And, um, <laughs> and I came down like a ton of bricks, and I was impossible. But um, they put it on the album. So there are probably a certain number of albums floating around which have another song in place of God yes. on My Side. I'm sure they're on eBay right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the songwriting was, was new to me because I was an interpreter, interpretress of song. And um, somebody said one day, well, why don't you write? Everybody else is writing. Why don't you write a song? I thought, oh my God, what a thought. It's kind of scary, but I did. I wrote Sweet Sir Galahad. That was the first song I ever wrote. And um, thanks. <laughs> and then all of it, it was like a perfect storm. There were songwriters, there was a music, there was a politically charged atmosphere. Um, there had been the civil rights movement, and then there was Vietnam. And that was the glue 
all of those things made some kind of community that made us feel that that we were together and that's what's been lacking for so many years the people do good things but they don't we haven't made a community um, up until recently um, so the songwriting was probably my second leap and the first one was the ballads with everybody dying and the second one was songs um, topical songs and so they worked perfectly for me. I mean, the instincts were all there, and then somebody was saying what I felt and what I wished I could write about. So I sang those songs. Most of it was Dylan, you know. Uh, there's also a, a very beautiful uh, Phil Oak song that you uh, recorded. I was wonder if you'd like to play it. Thank you. I will. Uh, We talked about playing a song from way back, and then one from sort of around the middle, and then one current one. And what happened when I tried to do the songs from way back, they were very, very high in pitch. <laughs> and one of the things that happens to your voice as you get older is, as my vocal coach once said, gravity takes over everything. <laughs> so the one that I could bring from the early days was 1964, more or less, and it's there but for fortune. So. Show me the prison Show me the jail Show me the prisoner Whose life has gone stale I'll show you, young girl With so many reasons why they're there, but for fortune, go you or I. Mm -hmm. Show me the prison, show me the jail.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> With me, it was never the money, it was the adulation. So we're, we're doing just fine. Uh, that was very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, and uh, you, know, you had just been talking about your voice before demonstrating it so ably for us. Um, I wonder what it was like to actually, the first time that you realized that that voice was coming out of you, and that, was, <laughs> that that was your voice, I mean, were you just like, wow? You know, or how did you feel about it? Well, it took a while for the voice to build up to what it was. When I was 16, I was fed up with my voice because it was straight and I wanted a vibrato. So I started standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom going, ah. <laughs> and lo and behold, eventually I was doing it in the shower and it started to happen on its own. So I always figured I really built that up from nothing. Um, but I didn't think that I or my voice was really that special, you know? I just went about my life and <laughs> people went on listening to it. And then probably I was confused in my mind because people made me this certain thing um, that they looked up to and copied and the women were ironing their hair and all sorts of things. Um, well, you know, inside of me, I, I, I didn't take it that seriously. But I would say now, looking back, and I can say this because my voice is a gift, and I didn't make it. My business has been maintenance and delivery. <laughs> but, so I can say that when I hear the early songs and me singing them, I'm stunned. <laughs> <laughs> as we are, as we are. Well, that voice, uh, both your singing voice and your, the voice that you use to speak out, you know, brought you to many, many places. And uh, you know, I mentioned a few of them you know, earlier. In many of them, uh, you know, there was real violence going on. And as a you know, person who believes deeply in nonviolence, you know, that wasn't a viewpoint necessarily shared by the Ku Klux Klan or <laughs> death squads in Chile or, um, you know, people doing uh, sniper fire in Sarajevo. I was wondering uh, what you draw on to, a, to, to get yourself into a situation like that and to be willing. I mean, I, I watched footage of you, you know, walking down, uh, you know, a street in Sarajevo where every single window is shut out, every single, you know, store was boarded up, every, you know, there are bullet holes in every wall. Um, you know, the shelling was, was a, a daily kind of activity, and there you were. Uh, can you, you just, I mean, talk about what it, what it takes to, to do something like that? Well, first, I think one has to be ready to take a risk, and that's been very, very rare in these last few years. And um, the word sacrifice has gone completely out of the language. You know, that's a no-no, that's liberal, et cetera. Um, so, I was willing to take risks, and I didn't usually experience something as, as frightened, but sometimes, like in, when I was in Hanoi in 1972, I was scared. I mean, I didn't plan to be there during a bombing, but a few days after I arrived with um, three other people from the States to, to just expose ourselves to the Viet Cong and the, the uh, demonized people and maybe come back with a picture of them that would help people get over some of that terrible demonizing. And so um, I was there for three days doing what people do. They take you around to museums and they take you around to places to see all nasty pictures of what's happened to them. And that's understandable, but I really didn't like it. And then um, on the third day, we were sitting at dinner, and I heard this siren go off, and I thought, oh, they must um, have, they must have regular um, siren practice, what do you do, everybody? Well, it wasn't, it was the real deal, and they took us outside, our hosts took us outside, and I thought, hmm, this looks like a bomb shelter. 
And it was, and then we heard the planes. And still, I didn't know enough of what was going on to be afraid. And then we went down into the bomb shelter, and then the bombs started to fall. Well, that was my first encounter with realizing that I was, in fact, mortal, and that there was nothing I could do except pray. Then I felt bad about praying, because if I didn't pray, if I prayed for myself, I felt as though I was asking the bombs to fall somewhere else. <laughs> so it all became difficult. Eventually, I began singing down there a lot. And song, by the way, is part of the answer to that question. Um, I've seen music um, do extraordinary things in these situations. I thought the other day about in the Civil Rights Movement, seeing, you know, it was a big demonstration there, police all over the place looking for something to do. And two young boys, probably in their early teens, had a sign up. I don't remember what it said, but probably something like freedom or something, you know, really terrible like that. Um, <laughs> So the police came over and the kids were singing. I don't know which song they were singing, but they were singing and the cops were and they came over like that and the kids fell to their knees and held the sign up and um, continued to sing. Um, the police were completely lost. I mean, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Um, so I, you know, I learned from the, cor the courage of other people, particularly young people in the civil rights movement. Um, they would walk with us and, and kind of get us behind them when they thought things were dangerous. And they'd say, well, they, they might think that you're a, <laughs> they might think that you like Negroes. And I said, yeah, they might. You might be a Negro. You know, <laughs> somebody's going to aim at you first. But real bravery, which then lent itself to me. And another answer to that is that Coming from where I come from and ending up where I ended up, sometimes I simply didn't get it. I mean, in, in Argentina, um, planning a demonstration with the mothers of disappeared, and I was with Perez Esquivel, who is the Nobel, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize winner from there. And we were planning this, and then he went out to take a walk. We were in his office, and he came back, and his face was pale. And we said, what is it? And somebody, he had turned a corner and somebody just held their coat open like that and they had guns. And it was just a warning to him. And so he said, please don't, don't march tonight. We won't march tonight. But I didn't get how dangerous it was. And when you come from your protected home in this part of the world, you just don't get it. Maybe that's a nice way to stay in denial and keep yourself from worrying too much. But... Um, and then when it was very, very real, like Hanoi, then I felt it, yeah. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, I mean, after an experience like that, it certainly didn't, you know, stop you from, uh, you know, going to other places. Uh, in addition to song, which, uh, you know, as you've shown in many performances, is part of how people keep their spirit up, yeah. you know, in situations like that. Uh, also, humor, it seems like, you know, I, I wonder if you could talk about, uh, you know, when you, when you would be around Martin Luther King, say, when he wasn't, when you weren't on a march, you know, and what exactly he was like as a, just as a person. Well, Dr. King was coming into the SCLC um, big conference somewhere in South Carolina, I think. And um, he was coming in on a plane, and they were going to let me go in the car with them. So it's Andy Young and Jesse Jackson and James Bevel, and I think one more person. I was so excited, and I thought, I'm going to hear the real deal about how they plan a march, etc. So first of all, we picked him up, and they told jokes all the way from there <laughs> to King's favorite restaurant, which is a small place where he had, predictably, fried chicken. He had okra, Ugh. he had what, <laughs> potatoes, I guess. At any rate, he ate the whole thing, they joked the, the whole time, and then the, the woman who owned the place and knew him very well came around and said, would you like a piece of apple pie? And he said he'd love a piece of apple pie, and then he ate all that up, and she came back, would you like another piece of apple pie? And he said, no, no, no. And about 30 seconds later, he said, I believe I will have another piece of that apple pie. <laughs> And so, you know, all this joking and carry on, I was still waiting to hear them plan the march. <laughs> so later in the day, um, 
I talked to Andy Young and I said, I thought I was going to hear you really plan a demonstration. He said, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so I think King was afraid to show too much of his humor to the press and so on because they wouldn't think he was serious. And, you know, they would grab at anything to, to make him, you know, to heavy, make his load a little heavier. So, but he was a very funny man. And also, the expression laid back, he was the most laid back human being I've ever seen in my life. He was walking into danger practically every day, and he walked slowly. You know, and, <laughs> oh, I believe I will have another piece of that apple pie. You know? <laughs> and then there's a story that I, I've told many times, but he was, we were staying in uh, Alabama and he was supposed to give a speech at a church down the road, and he was staying in the, the, the home of a local um, black family. And so we were all there waiting for him to get up and go to the speech. I mean, the church, it was a church meeting. And I didn't know yet about CPT, they call it color people time, that, that it's almost rude to go on time. Um, so he, but he was overdoing it. He slept an hour, it was an hour past when he was due, then it was an hour and 20 minutes, so finally Andy came to me and he said, go in and sing to him. <laughs> nobody else wanted to wake him up, so I was scared to death, my knees were knocking, and I went in and just started singing, oh, I don't know, swing low or something appropriate. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. King rolled over, went, Mm, I believe I hear the sound of an angel. Let's have another one, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> I think eventually he got up. <laughs> the, uh, you know, one of the, possibly the, the greatest body of, of, of songs that you've, um, you know, interpreted are Bob Dylan's songs. And it was somebody that you were close to. You became sort of the, you know, the kind of, king and queen of peace for a little time or, or a <laughs> protest or something or nuttiness <laughs> right i wonder if you could just you know talk a little bit about meeting him and you know what he was like and and you know what was so distinctive about him as a person and you know and him as a songwriter that you know became so important for you in your personally and in your work well i met him as a songwriter it was in Gertie's Folk City, when it still existed, and it was a hootenanny night, I guess, and somebody said, you gotta hear this kid, you gotta hear this kid and the songs he writes. So I went, and I saw that really this grubby character on the stage, he had absolutely no interest in how to look nice, you know. <laughs> He had more important things to do, and he really did. And um, I don't remember what he was singing there. I think he was singing Blowing in the Wind, because I went to get a taxi cab, and I was so excited about this song. And Dylan was outside the window saying goodbye, and I said to the cab driver, he's a songwriter. He's a real <laughs> poet. And the, the driver said, does he rhyme? That's <laughs> <laughs> all I could, that would make him, you know. Um, he didn't have to rhyme. Um, it, what's wonderful about Bob from the beginning and on through, that most of his songs are understatements. I mean, none of us can ever really figure them out, but I realize that, that, that <laughs> and I know enough about myself to know I'll never try and figure him out, because I can't. And neither can anybody else I know. Um, but he was the most important, of course, of the topical songwriters. It, nobody could really touch him as far as I felt then, and I think I still do now. He gave us the most music for our arsenal, for the peace movement, um, more than anybody else, and more brilliant than anybody else. So I don't know, I don't really know the difference in what my career would have been without those songs that were so important during the perfect storm. They were our arsenal. Well, he also um, inspired uh, one of your greatest songs as a as a songwriter. I wonder maybe if you would uh, like to play that one. Hint, hint. Hint, hint, yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Sure.
and I don't know how to work. <laughs> My ignorance about guitars, um, how they work, how you tune them, is just monumental. <laughs> it always has been. But so if you all of you would start talking, that would help. I have to tune it now. You know, they have this little electronic jiggy. Now, and I used to take long, long time between songs, and then they made this little electronic jiggy, and now I take a long, long time between songs. <laughs> But for my 50th anniversary of my career, I'm going to get somebody who tunes my guitars while I'm singing. Whoopee! That'll be. <laughs> yeah, we already have that person. <laughs> Seen already a legend, the unwashed phenomenon, the original vagabond. You strayed into my arms, and there you stayed, temporarily lost at sea. The Madonna was yours for free. The girl on the half shell would keep you unharmed. Now I see you standing with brown leaves falling all around, snow in your hair. Now we're smiling out the window of that crummy hotel over Washington Square. out white clouds mingles and hangs in the air speaking strictly for me we both could have died then and there Telling me you're not nostalgic 
Well, give me another word for it You're so good with words And at keeping things vague Cause I need some of that vagueness now It's all come back too clearly I once loved you dearly And if you're offering me diamonds and rust I'll take the Grammy Thank you Well, you know, we, uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask you a few more questions and then we'll, we'll open the floor to, uh, to our audience who may have some questions as well. But uh, I'd love to talk to you about your new record and... Uh, Go right ahead. <laughs> so, well, in that case, thank you very much. Um, talk about working with Steve Earle. What was, uh, what was that like? Um, it was suggested that Steve and I work together and he would be the producer and happily the writer of some of the songs. And, um, and he played guitar through it. And I actually came up with most of the songs on my own except for the ones that he wrote. And there are three of them that he wrote. Um, but, it, you know, he, he shares, almost shares my politics. I call him Mr. Pinko. <laughs> he calls me boss, and, and I call him Mr. Pinko. But um, he's full of life. He's full of a kind of craziness. He's full of having recovered from some really awful years. Um, he's musical the way I wanted the record to be musical. I want it to be um, basically a bookend after 50 years from the very beginning in um, Club 47 in Cambridge. And I think that we came as close to that as we could because I wanted fresh contemporary music. Um, the first song that we found in the record was kind of made around it is a Tom Waits song called The Day After Tomorrow. And we ended up calling the, the record the Day After Tomorrow. Um, there were, it's not, politically planned, it's not spiritually planned, that things just fell into place. I think they do. Um, you know, uh, there were some songs that I sang that didn't really, you know, ring the bells, and so we didn't use them. But we, our, you know, we ended up with, with this bunch of songs, and they're totally acoustic, and there are four or five musicians, because Steve would play on some of them. He had a knack for going and writing a song, which really pissed me off, because he would go, he'd say, I think I have a nice tune. I really got a nice tune. I think maybe I'll write some words. I said, oh, do. And he came in the next morning. He said, oh, I got it written. I finished it at 6 o'clock this morning. I thought, oh, hell, I wish I could do that, but, but I can't. But anyhow, they were wonderful songs, and it was very quick. I've always made records very quickly. I think we took a week, something like that. Um, and some people take months, and they go back and they now they twist this and they tweak that. I, oh my God, I'd be so bored by the end of that. So I like to, you know, make them fast, and we did, and he agreed. And um, then he bopped off on tour, and we had an engineer put it together, and bang, there it was. <laughs> you know, Steve is a great student of, uh, you know, the era in which he started performing. I mean, he more or less moved to the West Village <laughs> to kind of personally absorb, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, significant landmark, every former club. Yeah. And I was, I'm wondering if, you know, you found, was he sort of partly sort of querying you about all this stuff? And... Um, no, you know why? Because he knows it already. <laughs> he really, I mean, he's a compul compulsive talker. And I said, will this work? <laughs> and he said, yeah, but well, then I realized I didn't want to do that because he talks a lot, but it's all interesting. 
He knows a lot, he reads a lot, and he's really a fountain of information, and I figured that out and quit trying to get him to stop. <laughs> um, you know, when you were talking, I mean, about, you know, Steve and, and other songwriters whose work, you know, you've explored, you know, it seems that, um, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years or so, you've uh, kind of discovered and, you know, found a kind of cache of, of songs, you know, by younger songwriters that uh, partake of the tradition uh, of, of songwriting that, uh, you know, that, that really first energized you as a performer. And I wonder if you could, you know, talk about, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that process of, of finding uh, songwriters and identifying songs and, uh, you know, the element of gratification that you, you take mm -hmm. in it. Well, first of all, I suspect that people have written the kind of songs that I would sing for a long time and they haven't been heard because it, people weren't interested or the world was just kind of a vacuum. Um, and some of those songs were heard, but uh, you know, also the radio really wouldn't play them if they meant anything. <laughs> So it's been a kind of struggle, I think, for a lot of songwriters. I mean, I don't know how long ago Tom Waits wrote Day After Tomorrow, um, but it was during the dry period, and it began to, you know, that began to, to people getting motivated. I kind of kid because George Bush is the best publicity agent I ever had in my life. <laughs> people are so fed up with them that they'll return to the things that, that gave them the strengths before. Those, those songs, and I am perfectly clear that when I walk out on the stage, I am walking history. So um, it's part of that, and I don't remember what you were talking about, so I wrote <laughs> Well, I was talking about... Uh, I could fake it, or I could just... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, songwriters, like, for example, you know, the other day, when you were, uh, you know, speaking with Dar Williams, for example, and you know, took her out on the road... Uh, <laughs> described a process that you called co-mentoring. And I wonder if you could, you know, just say a little bit about what, you know, what that meant for you and what, what you think it, you know, it may have meant for her and, and other young writers that you've uh, worked with in that way. We travel, I, for about 10 years, I would take opening acts of, of young artists, some of them sort of known, some of them not known at all. Um, and we had interesting relationship. Not all of them were half my age, but some of them were. And, <laughs> They called me the matriarch, and I accepted that. And Dar, well, Dar and I have a, a special relationship because she's just a sweetheart and stayed connected with me, and I've done some of her songs. Um, but I think during that time, somebody said to me, oh, it's so wonderful of you to be a mentor to these young artists. And I had never thought of it that way. And then I realized that unless they were also being my mentor, that it didn't really count. I don't think it can go just one way. And so I was doing something for them, hopefully introducing some of them to a larger public. And what they were doing for me was bringing youth, uh, bringing how younger people saw the world as it was now, then. Um, uh, the youthfulness on stage gives me the false impression that I'm younger than I am, and I like that. <laughs> um, and just, I, you know, I was helpful to them, I know, and they were helpful to me. I used, I used their songs at a time when I wasn't writing anymore. So um, definitely, I hate to use that in verbs and nouns, mentoring, but um, I was a mentor to them and they were to me. Well, I uh, wonder if you'd like to play the title song from your new album. Thanks. I think I'll just do that. See, he doesn't even hint. He just. Really well, it's so it. funny. I mean, you're so not showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to make it seem as if we're just spontaneously doing this, but it was all planned, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> if you must know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here I go with this bloody little capo that I don't know. If, the, if I really have a tough time, I'll ask the man who loaned it to me, who is uh, John Doyle, who's going to be my new guitar player, and he's wonderful, and I can't wait to go out on the road with him. Give him a wave, John. He's Irish, and he's shy.
I got your letter today And I miss you all so much here Sorry, I'm going to change that tune That's a little. This time it's going up To accommodate some of the songs from the old times, which I love I just have to drop this capo and hold my breath and hope that the notes will come out right but I had to spit this one too low I got your letter today and I miss you all so much here and I can't wait to see you all And I'm counting the days, dear I still believe that there's gold At the end of the world And I'll come home to Illinois On the day after tomorrow It is so hard and it's cold here And I'm tired of taking orders And I miss old Rockford town Up by the Wisconsin border And what I miss you won't believe Shoveling snow and raking leaves And my plane will touch down on the day after tomorrow I close my eyes every night and I dream that I can hold you they fill us full of lies everyone by about what it means to be a soldier Still don't know how I'm supposed to feel About all that blood that's been spilled God on your throne Get me back home On the day after tomorrow You can't deny the other side Don't want to die any more than we do What I'm trying to say Is don't they pray To the same God that we do Tell me how does God choose Just whose prayers he will refuse Who spins the wheel who throws the dice on the day after tomorrow fighting for justice I am not fighting for freedom I am just fighting for my life and another day on this earth deep I just do what I've been told we're just the gravel on the road and only the lucky ones will come home on the day after tomorrow And the summer It too will spade And with it comes The winter's frosty And I know We too are made Of all the things we've lost here But I'll turn 21 today and I'm saving all my pain and my
my plane will touch down on the day after tomorrow. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's, uh, let's have some questions, if anybody's got some questions. Sir? Yeah, I understand that you knew the great writer and mystic Thomas Merton. I do. And I wondered if you would tell us how you remember him and what you think he would have to say to our world today. Uh, the question, for those of you who might not have been able to hear it, is about um, Thomas Merton, uh, the writer and mystic, uh, asking Joan, who knew him, uh, what he would have to say to uh, people today. I really don't know what he would say. He'd probably write something beautiful and go on trying from his prayerful spot in the universe to um, move things in the good direction. I did see him, and some of you have read about it, I was invited to Gethsemane and visited him there. And I can tell you that he couldn't wait to get off campus and have a hamburger. <laughs> he's fed up with that healthy bread, you know. So he ate two hamburgers and he had a soda and made his day. So he also, I'm just thinking that now, like King, um, was terribly funny and, you know, fun to be around and all the things you wouldn't think that a monk would be. Uh, yes. Uh, let me just, for people who didn't hear, uh, this woman was Joan's classmate in, in literature class. Did I, I take say. literature? <laughs> I'm teasing. A great reader of books is our Joan. Um, and, and was talking about how Joan would, would perform, uh, I guess, for, for people. In the cafeteria, was it? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully no, not she's lit talking matches. About, she's talking about the scene in the, um, in the cafeteria where I would go and sing. Um, I may have taken literature. A couple of the classes, the teacher said, if you'll play us a song, we won't flunk you. <laughs> so that's my... You were allowed to draw a paint a picture to express your feelings in this particular literature, <laughs> this particular literature class. Um, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Joan, where did your long hair go? Um, <laughs> you know, when there are big events in people's lives, it something happened naturally. Um, I got pregnant. Whoopee, you know, time to change something. And it wasn't any hesitation at all. <laughs> you keep better track than me than I am. Um, yeah, it got shorter and shorter, but the big double whammy came when it, I really cropped it short. And it's been that way ever since. It's just a little, you know, they say that gray hair um, is resistant. I think it's stiff. <laughs> so it's different in some ways now. Uh, there's a woman with dark hair there. Is that you? Oh, it's on the subject of hair, of course. Please indulge me. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, we had to write to somebody well known. And, <laughs> and my classmates and I all wrote to somebody, and only two people in the class got responses. Wow. One from Helen Keller. Oh, my goodness. 
Thank you. <laughs> We came to the right place, I think. <laughs> I said, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These are like backstage passes when they have my mother's signature on them. She said, "Enough already." <laughs> Thank oh. you. Thank you. Uh, sir. I did. Did I meet? Oh, Susan? let me just quickly. Uh, it's Susan. Did did Joan meet Susan Sontag when she was in Sarajevo? I did. She was brilliant, but a little bit dark. And I had had, I had had enough dark. And then she said, you know, you really ought to go and visit the children's hospital. I said, I don't want to do a hospital. And she, you know, she wanted to get to the grimmest part of the situation. So I kind of teased her and I said, no, I don't do hospitals anymore, especially not children's. She's a good woman. She was a good woman. Uh, yeah, down here. Uh, rec recollections of Richard Farina, who was uh, married to Joan's sister, uh, Mimi, and uh, you know died when it, what, 21 was he? Or? She was 21. She was yeah. 21. He was a bit older. It was on her birthday. Oh God. Um, yeah, he was a gifted lunatic, so <laughs> well accepted into my circle of friends. And mostly, what I remember was. Um, I think he and Mimi had a good time for a number of years. I know I had a good time with him, which sometimes ticked Mimi off because he and I got in complete hysterics. We would invite people for dinner. He would cook a huge paella. We'd all start eating, and then he and I would go off into one character or another. Sometimes it was Indian, and we talked about the pucka boy, <laughs> you know, et cetera. And one night we decided we would go blind, and so we did, and we just bashed around the house. Um, and so it went, sailed through the top of a wardrobe and ended up in somebody's clothing. I mean, it was reckless, it was healthy. <laughs> and I remember him with their dog, Lush, and just the image of the three of them trotting around. Uh, let's see. In the back. Oh, there. yes. Uh, uh, the woman with blonde hair? Wonderful, congratulations. Thank you so much. I have loved you since I was a teenager. Thank you very much. Put on a guitar that nobody can even see. I'll send you one. Okay, thanks. Uh, the gentleman in the back in the white shirt. And I never really knew who wrote what. I mean, I would hear a song and I would latch on to it. I might find out, you know, who it was, or I might meet the person at a folk festival. But I just kind of grabbed the songs that spoke to my heart, and that was one of them. You know, I don't remember what the album was either. But for me, it, for me, it was as though I had a radar out and picked the songs that, that felt right for me, and that was obviously one of them. Uh, yes, uh, the woman back there with a the white shirt, maybe? Yes, that uh, Yeah, it's you. you. <laughs> you just... 
Oh. That's, not, that's the other someone one. Else, that, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to you later. I couldn't hear that. Oh, it was about um, an interview you gave that was aired, I think, on Soundcheck on NPR today. And you were talking about um, uh, your supporter of Obama. Yeah, it's an odd thing for me. I've never endorsed any candidate ever, and I've distanced myself as far as possible from party politics. So something must have meant something to me. Um, I think Obama may be the thing, the person, whatever it is, to make the perfect storm or make a storm. So what um, I have, and many people over this long period of time that I refer to as the meantime, have done good things. We've um, We've done what we can in the fields that we can. We've, and the problem is that we hadn't made a community out of ourselves. And to make that community, I think you really do need something to happen. And the first thing that happened, um, as far as I could tell, was Michael Moore. He put a crack in that wall of denial. <laughs> He put a crack in the wall of denial, and then Cindy Sheehan kicked a hole in it. You know? <laughs> but it really wasn't until Obama came along that that feel. I mean, you see black kids walking down the middle of a highway to get to the polling booths because they didn't have them near where they were, and they're singing, they're playing Martin Luther King speeches on the ch ch record like that. <laughs> so he said, I had, a, I, had a, I had a dream, I had, I had a <laughs> <laughs> It was fantastic, and you know, that's just one small part of it. And part of me is very uncomfortable, you know, getting that close to party politics because I don't like it. No, and I know that if, um, if Obama becomes president, he'll do all sorts of things that I'll hate. And I, I did write him um, quite a while back just to encourage keeping things as far as into nonviolence as was humanly possible. And he answered, and he said, thanks for reminding, what I'm, reminding me what I'm supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, I'll do that as often as I can, but you know, <laughs> It's hard to buck a stage full of generals, which is you know, what he felt he had to do in order to keep those people who were in love with the military. So he has to do all these things, and I understand that, and I've always understood that. In the past, it's been enough reason for me to not endorse anybody. But this time, it sways out like this. There's something, he would be a statesman, he's a statesman, we haven't had that in years. We don't even want, know what one is. <laughs> He has a picture of Gandhi hanging on the wall in his office, so something must be going right. And um, I think that you know, he would never embarrass us. We've been embarrassed for too long. Uh, yes, uh, there's a woman there. I think your hair is blonde. Uh, your old white shirt on. Pinkish shirt. I think Ellie? it's you. <laughs> you yeah. lady, yeah. Can you stand up and I can't hear you very well? Thanks. I watched Obama accept the nomination of the Democratic Convention last week, and um, he was talking about the hope for America. And I was thinking tonight, if you had one hope for America, what would it be? Well, maybe that we quit, ad quit identifying ourselves as Americans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was an accident of birth, and we take it more seriously than, than anything else on earth, but it was an accident and here we are. And um, I'm so sick of hearing American, that, that what we're aiming for is to be Americans, American first. And um, I don't have a grain of nationalism in me, but not for anybody, not for any country. When I started refusing to salute the flag, I was 15. And people didn't understand that I would refuse saluting anybody's flag, and when I actually did, and people saw that, it didn't make any difference at all, <laughs> that I had been non unpatriotic, and that was a sin, so thanks. Uh, yes, sir, uh, in the second row. Uh, 
uh, would Joan ever consider recording a spoken word album because uh, occasionally in concert she'll recite poems that she's written? And if I had them here, I would recite to you. I just had too full a week to try and get them. They're on the computer. I couldn't find documents. I mean, I hate that thing. <laughs> Every time I want to get back on the internet, I have to call down to the front desk. And then they say, well, yeah, we'll put you through. Yeah, well, I end up in New Delhi. And that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't help me at all. So anyway, I couldn't get a hold of the poems. But yeah, I mean, I think at some point it takes three months, put the book together, and put a CD with it. So that's my plan. Uh, and then there was a, a, someone in the front row there. Yes, um, I remember at the end of the 1970s, you published a newspaper letter that criticized Vietnam for its human rights violations. Um, can you tell us what do you think um, the human rights situation is, um, is like there now? What is the uh, human rights situation in Vietnam now? Joan had publicly criticized the, um, the, the, Vietnam, uh, the, the Vietnamese Vietcom, regime yeah. after the war. Um, I don't know what it is now. Um, I know that then um, I lost any left-wing friend I'd ever had because I was criticizing something that was really, they didn't want to hear anything bad about it. And I certainly understand the response of people who didn't like my letter, but the letter was about um, some of the facts of what was happening in North Vietnam under the Viet Cong. And I thought people ought to know that. <laughs> Uh, just maybe one or two more. Uh, uh, sir, this gentleman, maybe wearing suspenders? Is that, yes. Or glasses? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> change my have I changed my opinions <laughs> in the concert I will <laughs> have I changed my opinions over the years um you know the the bedrock uh, for me has been nonviolence, action, personal, um, to build a foundation under which we will no longer live, <laughs> you know, to try and just make a more decent world. That's remained, that's remained intact. Um, basically, I haven't changed much, no. I've, I think moving, to, moving over to Amnesty International um, was exactly right for me when I did it. It was the time of the Chilean coup, and around some point, and there was Greece, and there were hideous things going on in the world. Now, that is, maybe when I work with Amnesty International, I'll see the prisoners get out of jail and of torture centers, and I will feel as though I've done something. With a peace movement, you know, I knew that it would be forever and probably wouldn't happen in my lifetime, the things that I really wanted to see. So, thank okay, you. Uh, one last one. Uh, this woman there in the red shirt. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for every one of your albums since I was 19, I've been following you. Thank you very much. Huh? <laughs> John Baez, thank you. Yeah, yeah. a great, great pleasure.